situation in Central Asia was also becoming favorable to the Soviets. The alliance between the Bashkir cavalrymen and Bolsheviks that I mentioned in part 2 of the series was short-lived. Frequent clashes between the two ended up forcing the Bashkir commander, Zeki Valadov, to flee to the Basmachi movement in Central Asia. But even Central Asia wasn't safe from Soviet rule, with Red Army General Mikhail Frunze finally achieving what could not be achieved before, the Bolshevik conquest of Bukhara. Thus the Central Asian theater came to a close, with Soviet troop concentrations focusing on the Poles and Whites to the West. Even with a factory strike in Tula, the Bolsheviks were in a very strong position, although green peasant armies captured the Siberian cities of Tobolsk and Petropavlovsk. Green armies were even active in Tambov, the Don, and Kuban regions. Just before the conclusion of the Central Asian theater, the Baltic theater had also come to a close, with the Soviet recognition of Lithuanian independence in July and Latvian independence in August. But the two areas with significant fighting to be had were southern Russia and the Caucasus. Remember the Turkish forces I mentioned earlier? In the autumn period of 1920, they were able to capture the Armenian cities of Kars and Alexandropol. The Armenian Dashnaks were desperate for Soviet protection and thus opted to hand their sovereignty over with the proclamation of Soviet Armenia in Yerevan on December the 2nd. Eventually, the Soviets managed to score a peace treaty with Turkey, effectively booting them out of the Caucasus. One important condition of this treaty, however, was that the territory of Nakhchivan was to become an autonomous region under Soviet Azerbaijan. It had already been awarded Nagorno-Karabakh in a previous agreement. Funnily enough, because Armenia was secured by the Soviets, Azerbaijani officials actually recognized the territories as being a part of Armenia although that position was again reversed and then confirmed by the USSR constitution in January 1924. I guess you can say this is why Azerbaijan and Armenia don't exactly see eye to eye on things. Although white forces were practically reduced to nothing, General Wrangel held firm in southern Ukraine, and whilst the Soviets were distracted by the Poles to the north, he decided to attack the area north of the Sea of Azov. The offensive was costly, however the famous general Mikhail Frunze came to contain the white situation. With bitter fighting, the tide was turned, and on October the 28th, Frunze launched an all-out attack against white forces, eventually pushing them back into the Crimea. Wrangel had no choice, thus between November the 15th and the 17th, he decided to evacuate his remaining white forces to Constantinople, under the guard of British warships. The white movement was effectively no more. However, various pressures remained on the Soviets throughout the Russian periphery. During the chaos of revolution, Chinese troops actually occupied Mongolia, thus prompting the white Russian warlord Baron Roman von Ungern Sternberg to invade the country. Concurrent to Wrangel's defeat in Crimea, there seemed hope in wrestling away control of Mongolia from the Bolsheviks. However, it was short-lived. With a campaign of white repression underway, local support built up with a revolutionary provisional government being set up in neighboring Kiachta. However, Bolshevik support took time to foment here, as several workers' strikes in Petrograd, Moscow, and other cities unleashed a full-on rebellion against Bolshevik rule. This decisive event took place on the island of Kronstadt, just off the coast of Petrograd. As you can guess, the Bolshevik reaction to workers' strikes led to dismay among the cadre of sailors at the Kronstadt naval base, and thus they rebelled against Soviet rule. Although the rebellion was quickly put down by the ranks of Zinoviev and Tukhachevsky, it unleashed widespread debate about the ramifications of war communism within the Bolsheviks. Hence the start of the new economic policy, or as I would say, the hybrid economy which had both capitalist and socialist elements in order to appease for the excessive expropriation of resources dedicated to the war effort. Ungern Sternberg was now nearly alone in the fight against the Bolsheviks. The main white forces were gone, and apart from the Kronstadt rebels, there was only one major political actor left against the Reds, Georgia. It all started with the Georgian Bolshevik Sergio Orzonikidze, 
a close friend of Joseph Stalin, who decided to instigate an uprising in Lori. Much to the annoyance of the Bolshevik leadership, this provided sufficient pretext for a full-blown invasion from Soviet-controlled Azerbaijan. Wait a minute, should we really be invading Georgia? Although communist influence in Georgia was tremendously weak throughout the war, the brunt of Soviet attacks proved too much for the smaller Caucasian nation. The capital, Tbilisi, was captured by the Soviets by February the 25th. However, it wouldn't be until mid-March when the rest of the country was occupied. With the Soviet occupation of Georgia complete, Abkhazia was reattached to it concurrent to the end of the Polish-Soviet War and Kronstadt Rebellion. Finally, with the stability achieved in the West, Soviet Mongolian forces decided to wrestle control of Mongolia from Ungern Sternberg, culminating in an invasion on June. And so with white support waning, the Mad Baron was defeated at Kyachta just days into the operation. By the next month, the Soviets captured Urga, effectively sealing Ungern Sternberg's fate. He was executed by Soviet forces on September the 15th. Late 1921 and early 1922 were relatively quiet, even concerning peasant uprisings. The Russian Civil War was all but finished, and the internal restructuring of Soviet territories is what followed. The last remnants of white forces in the Far East decided to evacuate in October 1922, with Japanese forces following on October the 25th. To settle the nationality question, the Soviets further set up autonomous entities for national minorities on November, such as for the following groups. With the vast swathes of Russia under Soviet control came the time to form the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, first with a Treaty of Union between four founding republics on December the 30th, 1922. These were the Russian SFSR, Ukraine, Belarusia, and the Transcaucasian Federation. This effectively removed the formal independence of these political actors. Another year passed before the mastermind behind the Russian Communists' rise to power passed away, Vladimir Lenin. However, power had already gone to his colleague Joseph Stalin by April 1922, with his appointment as General Secretary of the Communist Party. No matter, Lenin's death must have left a pretty big mark on the development of the Union as it coincided with the adoption of the Soviet Union's constitution. By July, Gorskaya was also dissolved, with the English and North Ossetian Autonomous Republics replacing it. Sometime in Part 1 of the Russian Civil War series, I also mentioned how Moldavia became part of Romania via the Paris Peace Conference. Well. The Soviet Union wasn't happy about that and decided to set up a rival Moldavian Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, with its capital in Tiraspol, thus foreshadowing the Soviet occupation of Bessarabia in 1940. Equally as daunting, in November 1926, the Mongolian People's Republic was formed, thus solidifying its relationship as a satellite state of the USSR. Everything was thus set in stone. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, otherwise known as the Soviet Union, was formed. The Russian Civil War had finally come to an end. Sorry for the delay in the production of the final part of the Russian Civil War series. I've just moved from France to the Czech Republic, so please bear with me as I settle in my cozy new home. As always, I'd like to also thank my current patrons for their invaluable support. If you would like to become a patron and help the channel, please feel free to click the Patreon link in the pinned comment and description.